Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first Wimple webinar for 2020. My name is Kemi Ogunyemi, and I want to thank you all for joining us this morning. I'll just give a brief introduction about Wimpole. In 2014, during the WIMBY's annual conference, a major subject matter emerged, the low representation of women in politics. More importantly, was the dearth of suitable, suitably qualified professionals in politics and the effect of this gap on national development. As a result, female involvement in politics and in public offices generally became one of the focal issues for WIMBY's in 2015. The goal of WIMPOL is to increase representation of women in public office through influence and advocacy, with the objective of growing female representation from 4% to 30% in line with the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action 1995. We are, we, are, we are glad to have introduced the WIMBY's um, Women in Politics Mentoring Program, which will be launched later on in this webinar. I just have a, a couple of announcements. At the end of this webinar, a poll will be put up for a quick evaluation. Thereafter, an evaluation link will be sent to you all in the follow-up email. Please endeavor to fill it. We want to hear your opinion about this webinar. We kindly invite our dear participants who are not WIMBY's associates to become one today. And to those of us who are associates and yet to renew our membership, kindly do so. For inquiries, please contact via email membership at wimbys.org. During this webinar, you can tweet and tag us on social media using the hashtag 2020 WIMBY. <laughs> webinar women in management business and public service and on twitter at wimbys we would like to appreciate our sponsor the guardian paper and also extend a special thank to lady made in alex publisher and chief executive officer the guardian newspaper for her tremendous support Right, now we'll go into the matter of the day as we welcome the moderator. And I'll just introduce her briefly and then I'll just hand over to her. Honorable Nena Ukeji is a politician and a former three-term member of the House of Representatives representing Abia State between 2007 and 2019. As a lawmaker, Honorable Nena, as she likes to be um, addressed, sponsored and co-sponsored many bills. She's a strong advocate in the push for the domestication of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women Bill. Honorable Nena has championed or and participated in many crisis-related intervention actions in countries such as Mali, Central Africa Republic, Senegal, and Libya. Honorable Nena has delivered keynote addresses at several conferences and seminars, including Wimby's uh, conferences. She's a dedicated mother to a teenage son. Thank you so much to all our panelists and thank you so much, Honorable Ukeji, Honorable Nena, and I'm gonna hand over to you right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Omiyemi, um, for the very generous introduction. And I'll jump right into the matter of the day, um, and that's welcome an introductory speech. As we race slowly towards 2023 and another round of elections in Nigeria, I'm delighted to be a part of, and I thank Wimby's for this opportunity to discuss women participation in the public space. Any democracy that guarantees the right to every citizen of voting age to elect the leadership of their choice has the obligation to ensure it develops free and fair and inclusive policies that are reflective of all its demographics and all shades of that society. The outlook of that country's governance space 
must show convincingly a landscape that is indicative of its dynamic, diverse, and multi-layered complexities. Nigeria is a signatory to several international treaties and conventions on gender equality and proportional representation. Nigeria is also a signatory to several binding and non-binding international human rights instruments and declarations. Though not justiciable, the Nigerian constitution captures Nigeria's commitment to uplifting of human rights. It is said after all, that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights. For all of Nigeria's commitments to these international instruments, Nigeria, a country of an estimated population of about 200 million people, 50% of which are women, has only 3.8% of its women elected in the just concluded 2019 elections, a figure down by approximately 50% from 7.5 in 2015. At the 2019 general elections, there were 91 political parties, 2,970 women were on the ballot and only 62 women elected. The ninth house of representatives has a decimal 11 women out of 360 members, the worst statistics in sub-Saharan Africa, where the average percentage of elected women is 24%. 13 countries such as Kenya, Rwanda, South Africa, Mozambique, etc., hold specific reserve seats for women in parliament. Other affirmative action tools, legal instruments, and constitutional provisions ensure gender parity, strive to equality, and social justice. Under President Olusha Obasanjo during the year 2000, Nigeria formulated a gender policy which sought to achieve 35% inclusion of women in governance. 20 years later, this policy is unfortunately observed mainly in breach. Nigeria has no laws that guarantee representative participation or gender parity. The attempted amendment of the 1999 constitution and the electoral law to create the legal framework to expand the spaces for more inclusive policy have been wasteful exercises in futility. This conversation therefore seeks not only to understand the structural, cultural, institutional, as well as the stereotypical issues, but also seeks to create a platform to interrogate the legal and constitutional framework and to envision a more reformed Nigeria in the hopes that we may transcend our present circumstances to a more inclusive governance space. We must believe and therefore be able to show convincingly that our involvement is an investment in a more than just, in a more just and equitable and peaceful society. Our carefully selected esteemed speakers have a combined professional experience of over 100 years in the political and electoral reform space, with each distinct experience having shaped and advocated for a freer, more representative system. The theme a right to win elevates the conversation from a basic desire for inclusion and sets the tone for this conversation. As we welcome our speakers, all participants are encouraged to engage, reflect, and hopefully be inspired to strive for a better, freer, fairer, more inclusive electoral system that hopefully delivers better governance. And on to my speakers. The first speaker is Senator Bente Masigarba, a woman I know quite intimately. I served with her in her time at the House of Representatives as Chairperson of the Parliamentary Committee. Another woman who has challenged the stereotypes. She successfully ran elections in the House of Representatives from 1999 to 2007 from Kaduna State. From 2007 to 2011, she ran elections under the People's Party of Nigeria, this time from Adama State. She switched political parties. I was elected senator for Adama One North from 2019 to, from 2015 to 2019. She's the only woman in Nigeria to have contested one election the platform to two political parties represented two states in two designations as a representative and senator. She's also the first female chairperson of APC of the African 
People's Congress, the Dama West Street chapter. It's such a pleasure to see you here and I hope that I'm delighted that you could be here. The second speaker is Mr. Ahmed Raji, SAN. He's an astute constitutional lawyer, a senior advocate of Nigeria. He's been involved in 100 election tribunal cases, a resident electoral commissioner for five states on an independent national electoral commission. He has a broad understanding of the constitution and will definitely be an as it were event. Thank you for making time now to be with us. And the third person on our panel is Professor Ayo Senwa. She's a professor of law at the Dean Faculty of the University of Lagos with 30 years experience. She's also the Executive Director of Legal Research and Resource Development Center for 25 years. She's experienced in constitutional law, gender studies, and human rights. Her broad knowledge will be great for this event and glad, Professor that you found the time to be here today. And finally, Mr. Clement Wanko, a pioneering Nigerian human rights defender, founder of Nigeria's first human rights organization, the Constitutional Rights Project, CPR. He served as consultant to the National Assembly of Constitutional Review. He also served on the advisory board of INEC during the 2019 general election. He has worked for more than two decades promoting human rights and the rule of law in Nigeria. Today, Clement Wang was a director of the policy and legal advocacy, which is constantly working in electoral monitoring and promoting fair election. Thank you. Let us to the conversation. Uh, um, uh, so the Lord I can is say I don't know. Uh, I would like to mention that we'll be taking two calls during this webinar as a participant to ask questions during the Q&A box. The first call will be up for two minutes. Yeah. Secretary, please could you put up the questions for the poll? Oh, well, I guess we'll come back to that later. Next up is the panel discussions, and we'll go back to the poll um, as soon as we get that up. And the next next up is the panel discussions that will last 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. 
May I request that? Senator Venter. I can hear you. Unfortunately, you can see my picture. I'm having issue with the video. But can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, distinguished. Yeah, so what is your question? Or you want me to make a comment? I'm going to come back to you later. Um, the first, yeah, the first question. Thank you very much for being here. Um, Honorable Binter, the first question would be to um, Mr. Rajin Etienne. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. As someone who has run in three elections, as someone who has run in three elections, representing one constituency, I just know how as someone who has run in three elections representing one constituency, I just know how difficult it is. But your achievements, wrapping my head around them. Senator Binter. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for your question. Okay. Uh, I mean, Okay, I was, I, I was saying. Distinguished. I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, please. Okay. My question, you didn't quite hear my question. My question was that, as, um, you know, I've run in three elections and I represented just the one constituency and, you know, it's a very daunting experience. Um, so I can not even wrap my head around how, you know, you've been able to go through four elections, two designations, two states, and two political parties. Just how did you do it? Well, thank you very much for the question. How did I do it? Is, um, if I want to ask, answer the question, it's going to be very broad, but certainly is how do you get yourself involved in politics? What must have pushed you to go into politics? And um, why are the people always behind you when you have run for almost four times out of six elections? And uh, the most important thing that I have to say is that the essence of why I joined politics is to see, to be a voice to the to the Nigerian woman, and secondly, um, activities of mine has made me to be where I am today in terms of trying to get to the needs of the Nigerian woman, especially the Dantu. Like I said earlier on, um, joining politics started when I was working with the new Nigerian newspapers, and uh, the gender inequality came on board. I was negated, my colleague was uplifted, and I felt that, hey, even with the voice of mine, <laughs> and I will be treated this way. I wonder what will become of those women out there that has that couldn't speak out. And that was what pushed me in. And with the little activities I was doing within my community, I never knew that one day it was going to work favorable to me, trying to see how we gather women together and trying to let, especially those women in Puda, instead of you staying at home waiting for a husband to bring you money to buy your meal and what have you. We created a platform where we now said, okay, within the little community is that why don't you start selling A, B, C, D so that you can now start making money 
for yourself. I never knew that. One day that thing would work out for me. And when qualities came in, I jumped into it. The first one in 1997, I didn't make it, but that didn't deter me. And I said, I will make it one day. 10 times I will fall, 10 times I will rise. And definitely one day, it will be a, I mean, a history. And today, it is a history. Uh, for a woman to be in, into politics is not easy. Uh, the, 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 the odds are more on, on the woman than the man. Because everybody believes that politics is, is, is created just for the men, not for a woman. But at, at, it went on and on. The, uh, the bottom line of it all is that if you have a service to humanity, then politics will be the place for you to make your service to that humanity. And uh, 20, oh. 1999 came in, I won into where I was elected. And what was the reason? Somebody out there said, hey, we've been trying men and they have failed us. Why don't we give this woman the opportunity for her to see if she can make a difference? And that didn't stop in me. And I said, okay, for the opportunity to be given, I shouldn't allow that opportunity to be wasted. So we started on and on. And today is history that I came in, played my own game. And at the end of the day, a lot of women followed suit. And I can attest to one thing. Since 1999 that I've been in the parliament, the women that were elected, both in the Senate and the House of Representatives, played a vital role in community development and bringing about uh, I mean, uh, awareness politically to their I mean, uh, constituency. So I think women, once given the opportunity to serve politically, will, 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 play, will bring out a better deal for the Nigerian uh, community. Because women are agents of change. And I've seen that. And we have to encourage our women that to run for elected position. It is not a right to win for now, but obviously it is a right for every Nigerian, irrespective of gender, to see that once they go into any elected position, they have to look at the cons and the cons. But the Nigerian woman is better off when it comes to elected positions. So I, I don't know if I have answered your question well. political party to the other a woman from of northern extraction you know and everybody talks about patriarchal societies but it we also believe that it's a lot worse in the north so i'm going to come back to you to address that specifically you know your story is very inspiring however we're going to come back to you to you know speak to those issues um very very broadly now um the next person who i'd be speaking to would be Mr. Clement Wanko. Mr. Clement. I can I can hear you, uh, Chair. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Clement? It's such a pleasure to see you. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, fantastic. Um, my first question to you would be that as a strong gender advocate, there is a proliferation of civil society organizations in the area of gender advocacy for all the broad-based multi-sectoral engagements, attracting aid and collaboration from different partners around the world. We don't seem to see the levers moving in the direction that attracts more women to the public space. Quite the contrary. Over the years, we seem to see the space shrinking and the numbers dwindling. What in your position is responsible for, in your opinion, is responsible for all of this? Thank you, uh, moderator, and uh, thank you to Wimbis for uh, putting this issue on the, on the discussion. I think uh, the issues remain, uh, which is why you have uh, increased numbers of organizations, individuals, Wimbis, several other very important groups, not just women groups, but groups generally keeping the conversation uh, alive and burning and hoping that um, things would give. 
Uh, when you look around the world, you would see that increasingly the issue of women participation, but even beyond that, participation by disadvantaged groups um, is put right there. And women participation, the first poll that was conducted at the beginning of, of this conversation had asked whether um, panelists or indeed participants think that uh, governance will improve uh, if more women participated. Of course, more women participate in governance uh, means that you will see increased uh, effectiveness of government. And uh, groups are working on these issues, a lot of engagement with stakeholders, uh, with government. And this is, you know, conversation started way, way, way back. Um, looking back even to agitations by women's groups, if we look back to the um, the women's riot in Abai in the 20s, look back to activists like Fumi Lyra and some Kuti uh, uh, and Margaret Eko and several women who have done tremendously well to agitate on these issues and put them on the front burner. The challenge is that our political culture and indeed our social cultural environment creates a huge obstacle. If you look at the constitution, there is nothing in the constitution that uh, discriminates against women. Indeed, uh, the constitution is quite clear that uh, discrimination is on the basis of gender, on the basis of religion, ethnicity, and so on. It is prohibited. And you're right. The question is, why have we not seen increased women participation in governance? Why in the legislature or indeed across uh, positions, you have just 4% of women represented? Uh, when you look at the culture of the political parties, when you look at the uh, culture of our politics, then it tells you that a lot needs to happen fundamentally. Uh, it's a mind thing, it's a cultural thing, it's a way of doing business thing that has to change to allow um, for women to sit at the same table with men, to demand equality with men in the practices of the various institutions that exist. And you will continue to see more agitation on this, more groups thinking what is the best way to do this. And increasingly, it's becoming quite clear that you may have to uh, create sunshine legislation, including constitutional alteration, to achieve and force equality uh, in representation and politics, such that you have more women participating. But it is a critical issue. It is an important issue, and this country must come to uh, the point where it is decided that you must not and you cannot continue to keep away a, a significant population, almost 50% of the Nigerian 200 million population, you cannot continue to exclude them from participation. And I think uh, that push needs to be urgent and needs to happen quickly. Yes, Mr. Clement, I, I agree with you. And basically, that's the reason we're here today, because we all agree that that push is existential. However, um, as, this, as everybody starts to talk about this gender parity, inclusiveness, we seem to see so many CSOs, so many civil society organizations popping up. And my concern is that, you know, and the question I was trying to, to put across, is it that there's no alignment a sense of purpose within the civil society organizations. Yes, government has its role to play, the legislature has its role to play. However, I see that there are so many active participants in the, um, in the um, CSO sector. And yet, you know, my concern is that in spite of everything and the multi-layered representations, that it just doesn't seem to be working, you know? So we're all in agreement that it's existential. However, I'd just like you to interrogate that a bit further and probably tell me what the problem is. Is it that you, you the people in the CSO family, are not working together? You don't have um, a peer review mechanism? You don't see that the numbers are dwindling? Because, you know, from the about women rights to what we have today, where there's so many of you doing amazing work, the question is that there must be something you're doing wrong. And that's really what I want you to identify. What is it? I, I, we understand the patriarchal problems, the funding, all, all the structural and institutional. But what is it that you're not quite getting right? Because the levels are shifting in the opposite direction. 
Thank, thank you, moderator. Um, again, I, I, you, of course, you do not have a regimented uh, civil society environment. The whole idea of civil society is the freedom that it creates, that exists for different people to articulate and advocate on specific issues. Uh, is there a strategy? Yes, there is a strategy. I think everybody's concerned and knows that you cannot, uh, having come this far, uh, in creating awareness about the problem, which is poor representation and participation of women in governance, uh, you must now look at the options that you have. And a lot of people have come to the conclusion that you need specific constitutional alteration to achieve this. And, and the chair was the National Assembly for his, uh, you know, three terms, uh, Senator Binta Masi Garibal, has been in the National Assembly, and you know that these conversations have been going on in the National Assembly, uh, trying to find the right formula that does not threaten those who enjoy the privileges that exclude women is something that we uh, need to find some way to do. And when you talk to men who are in the National Assembly, the question for them is, oh, should, I, should we reserve existing seats for women so that some of us who are already in there would give up our seats. Who amongst us will give up our seats? Uh, the cultural, the political culture does not allow for women to have access uh, within the politics of the country. Uh, and um, you have quite a few women uh, who have come out to run for elections. Uh, Senator um, Jim, um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Jibril had run for presidency for, for, for a while and, um, uh, and didn't... Um, get in and the few other women who have also run for presidency have not been able to make significant uh, headway because of the slanting of the politics against women. So uh, Professor Shonaya even is a perfect example of a woman who has given a tremendous go at it and still the, the structural imbalance in the country doesn't allow that to happen. So I think that it is to find a strategy to find the right language. Uh, and when we look around the world and see what countries are doing, we should ask ourselves in Nigeria, can we find some way of increasing uh, women uh, participation, putting women into the room in the National Assembly? And, and our proposition, and this is a recent proposition that uh, we have come up with from, from the work that we do in PLAC, is that you should create, without necessarily taking away existing seats, create additional seats so that you would have in the Senate one more woman elected from each state of the federation who would have to, uh, for a seat that is specially reserved for women, no men vie for it. So you would have election in one state covering the state constituency where a woman emerges as senator. And then for the House of Representatives, you would have specific um, uh, uh, senatorial districts, and there are three of them in each state. You would have three senatorial positions uh, three House of Representatives positions created in each of the 36 states uh, of the country, of course, including Abuja, where only women can contest and become members of the National Assembly. This would not be proportional. This would be geographic uh, creation of seats that only women can attain and aspire to run to, into uh, for office. And you could also extend the same argument for State House of Assembly so that you have more women winning elections for seats specifically reserved for women and going back into the room and be part of the conversation. So you must give something. The present system must give to allow women to participate. And this system that I have proposed could run really for a certain number of years in order to give women some grounding in the politics. All right then. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I was going to get to um, different forms of affirmative action and interventions in that, and you kind of jumped the gun, but you know, you very cleverly skirted the response I was seeking. But thank you very much for your amazing um, answer. The next person I'd like to speak with would be Mr. Ahmed Raji, SAN. And I'm gonna come back to you, Mr. Clement, so hold that thought. Mr. Ahmed Raji, SAN. Thank you, moderator. You Thank me? you very much. A, yes, I can hear you. How are you? I'm good. And you? Fantastic. Um, 
Mr. Ahmed Radi, um, I'm going to ask you a very simple, straightforward question. Um, is the electoral value chain biased towards men? Well, not in so many words. But is that a yes or a no? Okay. Well, I wouldn't say yes, because uh, when we say value, we're not talking of the law. Because within the law, like Mr. Nwanko pointed out, there will seem to be no discrimination. But when you go into a value system, I, I will say that uh, uh, it is a, it discriminates against women and uh, it holds women back and more or less promotes men more than uh, women. So when you look at our laws, you will not find any provision. On the contrary, you will find clear provision saying that discrimination is not allowed, whether on ground of gender, sex, religion, or what you. But if you go deeper into our culture and you study us carefully, especially in the northern part of Nigeria, and even in some parts of southern Nigeria, I, I did a case sometimes going back 20 years ago where uh, a woman lost the husband. And then there are some properties for the deceased. And a brother to the disease came up and they said that, look, both the, the, the assets or the properties and the woman are inheritance. That is, the woman herself is to be inherited you can see that kind of a cultural value in our system. And this is quite affecting the way and manner the uh, women uh, are assessed. So straight to your question, in terms of culture, it is not so favorable to our women. But as far as the letters of the law is concerned, there is no discrimination. Apart from this, the system that we run, I mean the presidential system, because of the amount of money involved and the networking, I, I, I want to think that it is not favorable to women. And I give you an example. Today in Finland, the prime minister is a lady. The minister of education is a lady. The minister of finance is a lady. They are all in their thirties. I doubt whether such will have been achievable if it is presidential system of government. But because they all go into the parliament from their different constituencies. And that is why in Britain, you have produced some prime ministers who are women and up to tomorrow, there is no woman who has made it to the presidential seat in America. And we only have just one or two, three governors in almost uh, 52 states in America or 50 states in America. So to your question, why the law will seem to say yes, no discrimination, but in terms of culture and in terms of the model we're using, I mean the presidential system of government, it is not favorable to me. That's my, my humble uh, assessment. So, so, I mean, you know, and this is also one of the issues that we face as women. Because every time we speak to this, most of you all agree that the law is self evident, but it's not self evident. And it is. things like that, that we ask you the question, senior, senior advocate of Nigeria, but I should have five states, resident electoral commissioner, and I said the electoral value chain, not necessarily the law, because we agree that um, as far as the laws are concerned in Nigeria, there is nothing that specifically singles out women for disadvantage. But in practice, and that's the reason I asked you, that the electoral value chain, and I'm speaking 
everything from Congresses all the way to primaries to the general elections. Is that system deliberately skewed against women? Not deliberately, but because of our culture and the mule that we practice, it's not favorable to women. For example, it's a lot monetized because we practice presidential system of government for you to go for primary election, for you to go for the main election, for you to now go to the tribunal, for you to wait all this. It is almost impossible. And even for executive offices like governorship and presidential, if you see the capital, you've been there, you've been contested, and uh, you know better what you went through for just as a representative. When you now talk of senatorial, Senator Pinta was just lucky because um, I think somewhere, I won't mention the name of the state, a lady was trying to buy for something and uh, the next thing the house was burnt down. That how dare you? In a male dominated society, you want to come out. So these are the problems. Except something drastic is done. And that is why education is very important to remove this problem. You have to ensure that uh, the, 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 the women are educated and not just uh, turn into an object of uh, pity or to be um, held down so that they can really fight for their rights. Then uh, if you look at our system critically and you look at the nature of society where we are, I'm a Muslim and I know what the rule is when it comes to leadership. It, it doesn't really, really promote women to lead in Islam. But that is a pure Islamic society. But in a society like Nigeria, it's not forbidden. But where you have Muslims in majority, that inbuilt training will almost resist having a woman coming out. And that is why in southern Nigeria, it may be possible to have a, a, a female governor or whatever. You. In the north, I doubt, especially the northern Muslim areas, I doubt whether a Muslim governor can emerge in the next 50 years in Nigeria. So I think that is my uh, contribution as far as that aspect is concerned. Um, thank you very much. But um, I'll just leave you with one thought and then I'll move on to um, Professor Senua. You said Islam, but Pakistan, which is probably the largest, the most Muslim states, it's probably the largest Islamic state in the world, has had back-to-back -back female presidents. I'm going to leave you with that thought, and then I'll come back um, and we'll interrogate it further. The next person I'd like to speak with would be Professor Ayo Asenua. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Madrita. I'm open to your question. Let's see what I can contribute. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Prof, we all talk about the need to enact gender equality legislations. You know, every time, you know, people talk about the one, the single magic bullet to opening up this political space. They talk about um, the need to enact gender equality legislations, the need to uh, domesticate the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Bill, the SDG Protocols, and a myriad of gender-based protocols and treaties. The Constitution, and everybody, both gentlemen have spoken about the law, and uh, the Constitution guarantees on our foreign policy objectives that there shall be respect for international law and treaty obligations. It goes further to state that no treaty between Nigeria and any other country shall have the force of law, save to the extent that it has been domesticated by the National Assembly. So, and our inability to pass these laws through the National Assembly has been evident thus far. I guess that's the reason, that's part of the reason we're here. Um, do you honestly think that a lack of necessary legal framework is the major reason for the difficulty we experience in increasing the numbers? as advocated by many CSOs and you know, many people even on this panel. Um, thank you very much, Honorable Nena. I think that um, it's a bit, it's not simple, it's not straightforward. 
Let me first of all start with something I usually like to remind people of. The law is never self-enforcing. There's nowhere in the whole wide world where the law is self-enforcing. Human beings, the people, the citizens must be committed to the spirit of the law. And so that they're not constantly maneuvering around, you know, and looking for opportunities to undermine even the aspirations of good law. Now, talking about the Nigerian constitution, and um, I'll just speak to two parts. I, um, I'll speak to the issue that you raised about affirmative action, the, um, the, the reluctance to pass gender equality legislation, and the issues such as the fact that we are committed under international law to passage of those instruments, and yet yet we do not do. Now, Nigeria has an interesting cultural heritage and we have um, legal cultural heritage and we cannot run away from that reality. That doesn't mean that we cannot change our future, but we need to understand why what is, is. And now Nigeria has a legal culture derived from Britain. And in that legal culture, there is a record, the, the power to enter into treaties is a power vested in the executive. Sovereigns in those, pre, in those days before democracy entered into treaties between themselves. But for a treaty to become law within the country, there is a need to have the legislature, which in modern times has the constitutional powers and duty to make laws for the country. And so the idea is that the executive does not indirectly acquire lawmaking powers by entering into treaties and those treaties without more becoming law locally. However, there isn't also an assumption that the legislature is going to be apathetic to domesticating treaties. And that's why I keep saying that the law assumes that there will be good will, that, that there will be best you know, um, interest, the good of the people, will, the best interest of the people will always be priority. So that it becomes the duty of the legislature to look at every single treaty and look at the treaty with an open mind. I always hear every time we talk about domesticating CEDO, whether in that form directly or in some adapted form, the whole argument that it is external, it is foreign. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be. The, 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 what does CEDAW require us to do? For example, CEDAW simply takes us away from what used to be the negative rights, you know, the hands-off approach. And then CEDAW imposes obligations on the state to take steps to advance. And I think that the self-censorship that we see of the political class when saying that, oh, no, this is, um, this, is um, this will violate the other aspect of the Constitution, which guarantees non-discrimination, is actually ill-informed. I, I don't want to say that it is, well, without being rude, I would say it's either resting on ignorance or it is resting on calculated self-interest. And so I don't think that it is the fact, I, I, I would definitely not support, uh, maybe because I'm a hardcore uh, Democrat, separation of powers, you know, uh, advocate. I would not want us to go in the direction of the civil um, law jurisdictions where once a treaty is passed, it becomes law. But I would also demand an obligation on the National Assembly, maybe through a constitutional amendment provision that says that every treaty, especially every treaty identifiable as a human rights treaty, must be taken, must be reviewed, must be taken, and not just wholesale dumping or just never dealing with, so that we ensure that the aspiration of um, the government, because there is only one government, in entering into that treaty is also realized through the domestication of the treaty. So I think it's just that it is 
complex, but there's a logic to it. There is a rational to it, and there's a value underlying the shared powers between the executive and the legislature when it comes to translating international treaties into domestic law. But it ought not to um, culminate in what we have seen, which is basically um, like the legislature just frustrates the process of bringing down to reality the standards uh, in, in the international human rights instruments. I. Well, thank you very much. But you know, um, I, I, I think that while that may be very well be true, I think that the concerns behind, um, because there's been so many treaties that have been domesticated by the National Assembly. And I think that the basic concern we have is our historical, cultural uh, impediment to domesticating this particular law. So it's not um, an omnibus lack of domestication of treaties or protocols that have been entered into by the country. But I think that it, it just speaks to um, the patriarchal nature of Nigerian society. And that's the reason I ask, because so many times, so many CSOs would say to you that, you know, um, and everybody comes into the National Assembly and they're all trying to get us to pass the seed or bill. Now, it's a chicken and egg situation. We don't have enough women to pass the seed or bill or we don't get the CDOR bill because past we don't have enough women. But either which way, and saying that, and everybody hinges it on the lack of legislation. I understand the bottlenecks of getting those legislations passed. And that's the reason I ask, um, do you think that we can get past this non-domestication? Because our situation is getting very desperate. Um, can we get past these pieces of legislation to open up the spaces for more women in politics. And I'm just gonna have you hold that thought. Um, and I'll go back to Mr. Clement Wankwo, and I'm gonna ask him certain questions because you swapped the issue that we just need to amend the constitution to get these laws passed. So I wanna go back to Clement and ask him um, a couple of questions about how feasible that is. Thanks, moderator. I think it's very feasible. I, I think it's um, the momentum is mounting, and I think that uh, these conversations add up to the momentum. Uh, there, there gets a point where uh, something must give, and I think we're at that point because, quite frankly, the, the extent of men's control of government has not taken this country forward. Looking at Nigeria today, you can see the disappointment yeah. across the land about the quality of leadership. Um, so I, I think that the more women you have, and there is evidence to show that the more women you have in the room, the more conscious everyone is about doing things right. And I think you have, you have the right women in the room who are uh, communicating the right message, uh, showing the best examples of what governance should be, then you will certainly uh, see changes. And I, I would be quite insistent in saying that the, the cultural disadvantages that women face, the practices that have been a disadvantage to women means that you can't keep pushing and hoping that the men in the goodness of their heart would give the women the opportunity. That's never going to happen. Nobody gives up an advantage so easily. Uh, but I think that uh, you mentioned the civil society groups who have been working on this issue, the women's rights organization, uh, women of accomplishment who have been raising these issues. I think that advocacy needs to be put in place to ensure that uh, the men who control the decisioning at this time either are made to understand that they need to give uh, something or shamed to give something. And I think that the population of women, the numbers of women organizations, the number of uh, civil society organizations who are working on this issue, uh, mounting serious advocacy on the issue would mean that you will, because the conclusion I have from years of working on this issue and indeed several other issues, and there are different women organizations looking back, you, you look at uh, organizations like Women in Nigeria and indeed uh, several other groups who have been advocating these issues for a long time. The conclusion everyone has come to is that you must 
in the case of Nigeria, set uh, uh, creates sunshine laws or sunshine amendments, meaning that it has specific duration to say that you must give the opportunity for women to have increased representation. And that goes to the point I made earlier. Um, for each, uh, for the Senate, there must be an opportunity for a seat to be reserved in each state that only women can compete for. Yes. It doesn't mean that for the existing seats, women cannot yeah. all test for it. They, they, they can and should. But that additional seat means that if the women do not win in the existing seat, that they at least have one slot in the room. And you can do that for the different levels of representation. I think also, and maybe and, and Professor Aya Senwa yeah. alluded to that as well, about uh, CEDO and the provisions related to setting aside seats for women, we talk about 35% and all of that. I, I think that this is something that we should demand of the executive. I, I think it's completely unacceptable that you have a situation where the executive can decide not to be plural enough. And it's not just women. Uh, uh, across all of the different interests and devices in the country, uh, a chief executive may decide not to comply it's with the representation. So I, I think that we must get to the point where with representation, there is a law that insists that you must uh, reflect representation in those who are appointed into positions. And, and my sense is the, the, the more you create this, um, the, the more that you can achieve the goals that we're looking forward to. Yeah, but Mr. Mr. Clement, um, could, I, could I just ask, you know, and you, we speak to this in a very, very, um, broad way you know we try we're, we're very granular and you know every time we talk about these things we talk about opening up the spaces setting aside these constituencies for women creating new constituencies um you know i mean you've had ringside seats to the national assembly and you know how everybody's concerned about the cost of running government about the size of the national assembly um i'm thinking you know just how do you think it would be receptive for instance to the Nigerians to increase the numbers of seats in the National Assembly, House of Representatives, for instance, from 360 seats to, say, 400 seats, just because we need to expand the size of government to accommodate women, where we're looking at ways in which to cut back costs and shrink the size of government. So, you know, it's a fragile balancing act. And I'm just thinking that do you honestly think that put before the Nigerian people, this is from your experience in two rounds of constitutional um, amendment processes. Do you honestly think that this is something that the average Nigerian on the streets would be willing to um, accede to? A larger national assembly with say 400 seats in the House of Representatives given Nigeria's present economic situation? Yes, I, I think so. I, I was asked by the Speaker uh, of the National Assembly in the 8th Assembly to chair a committee looking at the funding of the National Assembly. And we did submit a report. And that report identified uh, that the challenge of the National Assembly wasn't so much funding, it was allocation of the funding. And when you look at the, what is now referred to popularly as the Oron Sayer report, it tells you about the wastages in government. Now, those wastages would pay for more women in the National Assembly. Wastages in the government, when you look at the Nigerian budgeting system, that means that you would have a repeat of the same recurrent expenditure year in, year out for almost 20 years. An office would, including its annual budget, that it would buy air conditioners, they would buy stationery, it would buy cars, they would buy this, and on and on. If the government is serious about dealing with the issue of reducing government, shutting out women is not the first place to consider. It's reducing the wastages in government. I think that it's serious enough, the issue we're faced with, that you open up the space because the women, more women in the room means that they may be even more prudent in management of resources and that would help to reduce the waste that we currently are dealing with. So I think that it is not a waste. I do not think that it's expanding government. I think it's really bringing in more representation from people who could in fact 
be helpful in cutting the wastages that we see in government today. And anyone studying the Nigerian budget would tell you that a more prudent management of the national budget would see this country save nothing less than 30% from the current system if this, country, uh, uh, if this country's budget was better managed. Well, thank you very much. And you know, that's a very important point that you make. And I see that the CSOs have their work cut out for them in trying to engage the Nigerian people and tell them because that is um, what they constantly say every time we come up with the argument that we need to open up the spaces and create more seats um, for Nigerians, that women indeed are more prudent managers of nation's resources. Thank you very much. And then I'm going to go to Honorable Senator Binter Masigarba next. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, distinguished, how do you do? Um, I'm okay. Well, I'm, good. I'm sure you've been f following the conversations. Um, yeah. You know, one of your greatest achievements is that, in my opinion, of course, aside from every other thing you've done, is that you've broken the jinx. Because every time they say that women are only women leaders, that that's the position we hold in the party hierarchy that we're only women leaders, and then when they get generous enough, they probably make us treasurers. And that's probably because of the point uh, Mr. Clements made, that we're very um, prudent managers of resources. Um, I want to ask you that as someone who became the first female chairperson of a political party in Nigeria, what were the challenges you faced in that emergence? It's very important, and you know, the past, but I just want you to be... Um, as succinct as possible, um, because we, we don't have that much time. And was it possible for you to achieve any institutional or structural changes in that time that opened up the spaces for other women, especially um, from the North? Because I hear a lot of that, which is not to say that women from the West or from the East have it any worse. You know? But I, I, I think that there's a there's an incendiary mix in the north, and so a lot of people think that you know believe, and it's probably true that it's it's more difficult for you because of your society. And I just want to know if, in that position, there was anything you know you were able to achieve any institutional or structural changes um, that opened up the spaces for women. Because the reason I ask is that I need to reinforce the argument that if we had more women in the leadership, in the party leadership, that would eventually it will translate to more women in the political space. Well, thank you very much. I will want to comment on two other issues before your question, but nevertheless, let me answer your question before digressing to other issues. Yeah, that's not a problem. As long as you make it, you know, very saucy, because we don't have that much time anymore. Thank you. OK. First and foremost, okay. when I became the chair, it wasn't an easy uh, task. A lot of campaign of calumny came on board. But one thing that stood for me was the governor and making some cogent points. We've tested men, we've not gotten any input. Why don't we try a woman? And this is one person that has drawn well as a legislator, and even in terms of planning. Yeah. The election was supposed to be held in the morning, but we didn't do the election till almost about 9 p.m. Why must it be a woman? No, she is. The Muslim community will not accept her. The Christian community will not accept her. She's too young for her to go there. But they said no. The antecedent of this woman we must look we must put into bed. And once they went out checking for people and everybody was like, why don't we try this woman? So election put in hold until about 9 p.m. It reached a stage and I said, hey, I think I don't want to push it further. But they stood there again and said, no, we want to change. And when I came on board, I put a lot of things on ground. 
First, we looked at the diversity of our culture, the religious divide, and we now have to see how we can leave everything into the ball so that we can move forward. And what was the thing that has been going on that I need to bring the change? So when people are clamoring for how do we win election, all what we did, and we got a little, about a group of three, four people to look at every polling unit and use the SWOT analysis and see if we can make it. And when people were shouting, were just every day in the week, about three times, that would digress, strategize, and believe you me, at the end of the day, we got what we wanted. But there are two issues I wanted to bring to our, uh, the panelists. One was the, the sun that I made mention about the Muslim uh, culture. And I want you to understand that in, in Saudi Arabia, at the Council of Shura, that comprises over 150 legislators, 30 of such were women. It wasn't easy, but the, the, the monarch took it upon himself that women must be brought on board. And for the first in history, the Council of Youth and Insurer produced about 30 women as legislators. And again, when we talk about our constitutions and why are women not given the right place for us to participate in politics, and when you talk about representation, other countries, what I were men mentioned before now, countries like Uganda, Kenya, uh, Rwanda, South Africa, made a political aggression to see that women are being given some certain representation. And if we are going to look at our constitution, that every 10 years, the Nigerian government ought to come out with a, a population census. And through the population census, we are supposed to create more of constituencies. On that, if you talk about 35% of 360, is 108. So each, if every senatorial district can give one uh, house of representative as a representation of women, definitely we will have a voice in the National Assembly. So the civil society has a lot to do. A lot of us have been clamoring for women emancipation politically. But when we have to take a stand, then obviously we are divided. So the civil society must be up and doing. Yes, uh, something that happened in Borno, the former governor now is a senator. Aggressively, he made mention that every local government must produce one female councillor. So there must be a political will for us to achieve whatever we want. We cannot be used during the campaign period and come out to cast our vote. But once after the election is concluded, then we are not being given the vote. I think it is high time for the Nigerian women to come out with a proactive measure to say, look, our vote will count if only we are given some certain percentage in yeah. legislative and democratic stand. Yeah, thank you very much, Senator Binta. But I, I just want to react to the comparisons that you made. And, you know, in the presidential system of government, I think that and a lot of the women out there who make these comparisons all the time, I believe they compare chalk and cheese. In those, in those countries, South Africa, for instance, the ANC actually goes out to run in these elections. When the ANC wins, in the ANC constitution, they allocate 35, uh, they allocate 50% of those seats to the women. And that's how come South Africa has been able to achieve the 50%. In Nigeria, as well as in the United States, the presidential system of government, the women are thrown in the deep end to run the entire gamut of the electoral process. And that's why if you compare the numbers in the Nigerian um, parliament, and you compare the numbers in the United States Congress, the percentages are very close. So um, I think it's also very important for us to interrogate the system of government that we use um, if we want to have those conversations. And I recall it in the House that um, there was talk 
about moving from the presidential system of government to the parliamentary system of government if we wanted more women in the public space. So um, hold that thought um, in the q and I'm sure um, that question is going to come up. And, you know, I just want you to think about it um, while we go on to um, the senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Raji um, Ahmed. With you. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, you know, in your bio, I read that um, you have um, done a um, hundred um, uh, post-election litigations, and that's you know huge. And you know, for us, is poverty, and you mentioned that as well. Poverty as a woman's face in Nigeria, and election extremely expensive. And, you know, the cost of elections are exorbitant, absolutely, totally. And the cost of elections, you know, is astronomical. All legal attempts to regulate election spending have proven ineffective. You, you know that um, from the INEC point of view. And that includes um, the exorbitant cost of post-election litigation, with a lot of lawyers you know, demanding huge fees. I mean, it goes anywhere be between Two million and a hundred million naira for senior advocates of Nigeria. Now, um, the, my question is: What's your advice to women on managing the cost of elections, the post-election litigation process? Because that is very important. If we don't have good lawyers, no matter what we do, it's taken away from us. I'm happy for that. So, what is your advice, and what do you think we should do? Well, my advice is just for like any other politician, you make sure you win because the electoral laws are not petitioners friendly. Starting from how to gather the evidence, the time element, and the time allotted for disposing of the cases you really don't have the opportunity to prove anything before the tribunal. And that is why the rate of success is very, very low. If about 1,000 petitions are filed before the tribunal, maybe 20 or 50 will succeed. And those that will succeed will not be on issue of force, maybe on qualification or falsification or line on oath. But when it comes to issue of oath, do we have the right votes here? Do we have the right number here? And then you have to add up and then give to them and say you have won. You, are, you will be swimming against the sea. And it is very, 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 very tough. You see naked injustice, but you don't have the legal system. is not equipped enough to redress most of these wrongs, if not almost all the wrongs. So my advice is to women who want to take part in politics, win. Let you be the respondent and not the petitioner. It is not easy to win before the tribunal. I don't know whether I've answered the question. Well, you know, you 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 just you just dampened my hopes because um, the basic reason we're here is because you know it's almost impossible for women to win. And so basically, you're saying to us that I'm, I'm you know, saying... just make sure you win. When I say we find it difficult to win. And no, you know, no, so no, I'm, you ask me what advice should I give? I say ensure that you win the election. Don't put your hope. The, on, don't put your hope on going to the tribunal. Okay, but in the Nigerian set, we we find it difficult to win. We have electoral violence skewed against us. We have funding skewed against us. We have institutional structural considerations skewed against us. And so, yeah. if we can't even get redressed in courts then, you know, basically, it means the space is just not going to be open. Well, in that case, my advice is you should push for reforms. And the reform should be like this. One, education for the women. A lot of education for the women. Because you are asking for women to come to power. What quality of women are we talking about? Some of the women will come, go there and disgrace you. And it's not as, as sweet as Mr. Wanko has put it that when you have more women in the in the room, things will be better. I doubt it. Are these not the same women who are first ladies messing up the whole states? 
turning the state to their apostles, giving back to, I mean, I mean, all this to carry for them and then embarking on projects without, a, a, I mean, without appropriation from the houses or the parliament? Are they not the same women who want to ride the state more than the governors duly elected? So what quality of women are we talking about? So but with the right education, we'll get there. And then secondly, there should be a reform of the political system. And I think in this regard, moving away from presidential system will create a better space for the women, i.e. going through a parliamentary system like in Finland, where we now have a woman prime minister, because you don't need to go for a presidential election with a lot of huge expenses, which most women will not be able to afford. Clinton was able to do it for the first time in America because of in America to contest. But in UK, we have at least had two or three prime ministers who are women. We need to push for reform so that women can go to the parliament and based on their knowledge, output, not necessarily because of the agenda, but because of their output, because not all women are good. Let us not kid ourselves and begin to say that once women are there, everything will be right. Who are those misleading most of these governors and they are, they are not performing very well? Are they not their wives? The so-called first ladies? I'm sorry to say. Thank you. Okay, well, well thank you very much for your very impassioned response. But um, I think that the quality in the political space is not, is not you know, partial to the set of chromosomes that are arranged in any of the candidates. So I think that you know, it's an equal opportunity um, death of quality, both for the men and the females. So I'd have you hold that thought and I'll go right back to um, the professor. Thank you very much, Honorable Nena. Yeah. Just go ahead. Yeah. Um, would you say that the provisions of Section 42 of the Constitution grants equality with one hand and takes it away with the other hand? <laughs> I ask this because every time we have tried to amend or to come up with affirmative action pieces of legislation in the National Assembly, the men in their defense and in trying to shoot down that piece of subsidiary legislation, we always say that it is reverse discrimination, that affirmative action is discriminating against the men and that reverse discrimination is discrimination anyway. So um, what, what would you, you know, What would you advise? You know, I, I I don't know. What would you want to say when that argument comes up? Because it has suddenly become like a cookie cutter. Every time you come up with that, that is the go-to place for um for the defense of not voting for it. So what would your advice be? Okay, thank you very much, um, Madam Madrito. Um, just before I answer the question, I think something comes out from what Mr. Raji said, and when he had some suggestions and recommendations, I thought he would include that. He did note that the legal system, maybe the legal rules, and um, they're, they're not well, um, they, they are not responsive, they're not adapted to the kinds of situations. And maybe that calls for, you know, real analysis so that we can make proposals for reform even in that direction. I just think that we shouldn't lose that because if there's a problem, laws do not come down from heaven. Laws are made by men, laws are dynamic. They're supposed to be suited to respond to the imagined desires for justice or understanding of justice. So it also means that it, we need to look at how the legal system, its rules, its principles might make things a little bit more difficult I'm not saying that the legal system is conspiratorial, but maybe it just was not equipped to respond to the kind of challenge that is emerging. And we need to look at it very closely to be able to make substantive proposals for reform specific aspects. Especially because the one thing that we've learned over the years is that we can make laws to respond to specific um, justice needs or aspirations. Now to the issue of section 42, um, section 42 and frames 
the right to non-discrimination following um, how we understood human rights some 100, 150 years ago. And we conceptualize human rights as basically don't interfere, hands off, do not discriminate. And so equality was a right to non-discrimination. But what has happened over the last 50 years is that the world has also moved forward and has understood equality not just does not do not discriminate, but has also understood equality as take positive discrete what appears to be discriminatory steps in order to redress historical discrimination. In, in some jurisdictions, they did not need to amend their laws. The jurisprudence evolved and it settled. So we talk about negative, we talk about positive. And in those, the jurisprudence is very clear. The whole world's been using it. It was used after um, racism, when the courts unpacked racism and said, no, affirmative action is not discrimination. It was used post apartheid and it's so for anyone to say that section 42 says you cannot act to reverse historical or his institutionalized equality i do not want to be disrespectful but that is resting on ignorance and that is self censorship which is needless there is no reason for it I would even say, so if you believe, we, you, if the legislature does believe that truly we need these laws, why not enact the laws and let the laws be struck down? Why self-censor? But the bottom, because the truth is that there is positive discrimination. And I note that my colleague um, Clement constantly said, maybe time bound, maybe not forever, but the bottom line is you take steps forward. You cannot have historically supported discrimination against a group of people. We're talking Black Lives Matter. We're now beginning to unpack. We're understanding how when the Blacks had the wealth, they were excluded from you know, investments, maybe in property, in such a way that they could not grow their wealth. And now today, that is what we're talking about. So we can't say that, I mean, if we will be arguing today that American constitution that guarantees equality has not delivered equality, and we're part of the Black Lives Matter campaign, and we support it, whether, I mean, directly or indirectly, immediately or from a distance, it's the same logic that's playing out here. So clearly, we need section 42 to be expanded. I do not think that we can wait for jurisprudence to expand Section 42 again because it has been slow in coming. And so we need a trust in Section 42 as we have in, say, something like CEDO that says that nothing in this section will uh, prohibit or render unconstitutional a provision that seeks to advance, you know, to, to redress the historical discrimination and it could be time bound, howsoever it is couched. But I will say that we need to make clear to legislators every time that comes up that no, that is not the only law. That was the law. The law as of today is that it is no less um, part of preventing discrimination that you have laws, affirmative action related legislation or gender equality legislation to basically redress, to alter. Law is supposed to shape how people think. And if we think that people did not change when law talked about non-discrimination in the way it currently uh, elaborated, we think that we need to unpack and we need to help people understand that it also includes positive action. And the question I was ask is, how come we are comfortable with this federal character principle, which is even constitutionalized, that allows someone who has scored 200 to gain admission into medicine and drops off some people who have scored 272 because the quota for their state is filled. And because we want representation, I do not understand how we can argue that gender equality legislation is unconstitutional when by statism, you can get some access which some other person cannot get. 
It's the same logic. And so I would just say that um, every time we have a statement of that self-censorship, we really need to confront it and help the legislators to understand that this is self-interest driven or either resting on limited knowledge. My only worry though is, and I say it, it's never going to be easy because to get the constitutional amendment, we still rely on the same national assembly. And to get that change that you want in the constitution is actually more cumbersome. But then that it is challenging does not mean that we do not start on, you know, pursuing our aspiration, the goal that we really want to realize. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'm going to have um, one final question from um, Clement. The one final question from Clement before we go into the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Clement. Mr. Clement, one for. My apologies, I, I think I lost um, connection at some point. So I'm not yeah. sure yes, um, Mr. Clement, we're almost out of time. So I'm going to ask you one quick question, and that's on electoral violence, um, um, the Electoral um, Act Amendment. And um, electoral violence is proven to be one of the greatest disincentives to women's participation in politics. At its very best, um, we experience misogyny, um, you know, very interestingly. And at its darkest, and it's quite common as well, from the campaign process through the election day, people actually get killed. Now, there's a proposal before uh, the National Assembly for an Electoral Offenses Tribunal. And uh, as usual, as with everything you've seen and from all the conversations here, you've seen that there's a lot of um, work to be done to actually try to get gender-friendly legislations passed. And um, again, from what the professor has said, the National Assembly goes back to the National Assembly as well, again. And National Assembly matters, uh, members are politicians. And so the, the fear out there is that the penalty on electoral violence will probably be a slap on the wrist because uh, most of the practitioners are politicians, are funded by politicians. Now, what penalty, in your opinion, would be an effective deterrent and disincentive to practitioners of electoral violence. And I ask this question because as far as I'm concerned, it is one of the greatest deterrents, disincentives for all the women out there to, to, to come into this political space. It's gotten more violent over the years with the proliferation of small arms and light weapons, the access to guns and so on and so forth. It is a very dangerous space. And so I, in my opinion, it's one of the most serious reforms and amendments that we require. So I'm asking you, what in your opinion would be an effective deterrent and disincentive to practitioners of electoral violence? Well, certainly I think that you must create an environment where the best of your country, the best of this country can participate um, in, in elections and, and in decision-making. Uh, violence is a major disincentive, not just to women, but meaningful people who want to contribute to elections. Uh, when you look at the quality of those who are occupying political positions today, uh, which is why you're struggling a lot with politicians having to go to court and defend that they have a degree or do not have a degree. You look at the percentages, the quality of those who are emerging through actual contests for elections is very, very poor. When INEC publishes list of candidates for elections, you will be surprised that in some cases, more than 50% of the candidates listed as contesting for elections, even to the highest office in the land, do not have qualifications beyond school SAT level. A lot are people who are familiar, so very embedded in the intricacies and vices of the constituencies, that they are the ones who can unleash violence, who can unleash force, who can frighten meaningful people away from the political contest. So you must have a law, and that's why the advocacy has been on for a very long time. And this was part of the recommendations of the Justice Mohamed Nawal Uwe's Committee on Electoral Reform, and several other committees have made these recommendations as well. 
that you should create an electoral offenses commission that is able to function very robustly to bring persons who perpetrate violence in elections, but beyond violence, who use monies inappropriately, and that goes to uh, election campaign finance, who use the institutions of state. And we make this point repeatedly about persons, once they entrench themselves in government, begin to use the institutions of state to manipulate the process and become God in their use of power. So this country must put in place an electoral offenses commission. Uh, and uh, just to go back to the point about the quality, education, and so on of women. We, women need education, the men need education. And if you provide not just civic education, but really create an environment that educated people who come from decent backgrounds can run for elections, then the meteoric rise in the quality of elections and the quality of those who emerge and the quality of governance will be incredible and this country will be transformed so very quickly. So an electoral offenses commission must come into place and my colleague uh, 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 Ahmed uh, 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 Raji, uh, senior advocate of Nigeria, uh, yes there are, there are women who misuse and abuse power but men <laughs> you know, take, the, take the trophy in that regard. So you really have a situation that once you can begin to change the thinking, uh, that I think will mean that we can have better governance in the country. Well, thank you very much. And you know, Ms. Clement, thank you for speaking up for the girls. Um, it's always fun when you see a man take up um, a man in the very nice way that you have taken it up. If, if, if reading all the comments, you can see that we are getting quite rather emotional about you know, the comments um, about women abusing office. And I, I, I agree with you because um, just by way of proportions, you know, um, for the number of men in the public space, we definitely see a lot more men abusing their offices and the public space that we can ever see of women, considering that women are only 3.8% um, in the public space. And so I'd like to thank um, all the panelists for this amazing, candid um, um, conversation. And um, then there's going to be the Q&A um, immediately after this. But before that, we have the second poll um, that comes up shortly. And I'd like the secretary to please put up the questions for the second poll. Um, um, yeah. um, um, Secretary, could you please put up the results for, um, the second poll. Next up, um, we're going to have the Q and A's, the questions, and um, the questions, and I will be directing the questions at 
any of the panelists that um, I think the question, if you, if you don't um, attach a name to the questions, I will um, use my discretion and ask whatever panelists I think um, the question is suited to. Um, so we'll have the questions now. Um, to Honorable Benta, what do you think about us forming a woman's political party? What do you think? I mean, from one of the questions, um, it's to Honorable Benta, and, you know, the women think that we should form a women's movement, a women's political party. How feasible do you think that that is? I think the movement will be better off than the political party. Because if you now say, if you look at what happened to Ciro Bill, that has not seen the light of the day, is because of the word that is used as a metric. So if we can have the movement, women movement, from the grassroots to the state to the national and stand on our ground that hey we're all equal before the law and we have equal right to participate in elective positions and to participate in governance and we have even the uh, the population and definitely the movement will work better on okay when you say we have a political uh, movement it might not give a cogent participation. But once you have the women movement that will I mean, I mean put across all the political parties with a singular uh, action that everywhere a man stands to run for election, same position should be given to women. And definitely that will give us an edge because we have the number. And if you looked at during uh, uh, election period, more women participate in casting their vote than the men. So if we can have that movement and to now sell the, set the agenda that every woman has a right to participate in governance, to participate in elected position, an appointed position, definitely the men will sit up and give us a share in terms of uh, governance. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, the next question is to the professor, Professor Senwa. Yes. Okay. Yes. How can the National Assembly enact, how can we have put pressure on the National Assembly to enact the laws that we require? Okay. I'm glad you asked the question that way. We just got to put the pressure. It's got to be nonstop pressure. We got to mobilize. And so one thing I say to myself, who funds the process of pressuring? All too often it's donor driven. So hopefully maybe Wimpole, we can get something, but we got to be at the National Assembly with that law. We got to do the advocacy that it is needed. We just got to continue to put the pressure. I've always wondered, okay, so why don't we have why we could put the pressure on the exec uh, on the national assembly but maybe we could also put the pressure on the executive to make present an executive bill you know and um so we we use everything that we have we've just got to accept that we need the law and we've got to be there to answer the questions and to counter those um so-called um arguments against the law some people have said, I think I saw in the chat, someone said, for as long as you continue to use 
the word equality. You won't get what you want. I do not know, um, some have said, but the bottom line also is that we've got to, we, we, we must be careful. We must be careful to not to sell out because we're trying to pacify. The, we, we, need, we do have men who are allies and I have always held that the gender equation is not the only equation of equity or equality that we need to push forward in this country. I also saw in the question and answer section, someone talked about disability. The bottom line is we need an equal opportunities, if at all, we need an equal opportunities commission. We need to scrap federal character. We, if we want representation, then we need representation that takes in all the differences. The key word is the pressure must be on. It's not about one time and we get wearied. I, I, I do not blame anybody because I could I will take as much responsibility. But since we had the, the, the gender and equal opportunities bill thrown out about two years ago, it's like um, it, it was destabilizing. But we got to keep coming back. We got to keep coming back. We got to identify the allies and we just got to keep mounting the pressure. I don't even, it's not even impossible to make an argument, I am saying this, it's very idealistic, but to look at what opportunities that probably exist for um, challenging both the National Assembly, maybe before a court or uh, the, both the National Assembly and the executive arm of government for not passing laws that are progressive enough, you know, to safeguard the constitutional aspirations of equality, not within the framework of section 42, but within the framework of chapter two of the constitution, we've just got to use everything that is possible. And I will say that one thing we need to do by the end of this meeting is to think what concrete next steps and how's that gonna be funded in a way that's not donor driven so that it doesn't pan out when the funds run out. It's continuous. All right. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna um, thank you very much for all the questions, the answers, and um, I'm gonna say that we've had a very, very amazing panelist of people who are extremely knowledgeable in all their spaces. But what I have seen that has come out of this conversation is the fact that there's ways to go for women. What I have also found out is that there are certain men who are champions and who will come out and tell it to us as it is. Sometimes it's not very palatable, but then I think what it does is that it exposes the dark underbelly of the road that we have to travel, of the hurdles that we have to pass, the constitutional, the institutional, the legal, the uh, hurdles that we must pass as people to get to open the political space for women. And so um, we're gonna have to go to Mrs. Aziz, um, to introduce um, the Wimpole um, mentors. Um, I'm gonna come back um, when that's done, but I must at this time um, ask you to hold your thoughts and then I'll go back to um, Mrs. Aziz. So Mrs. Aziz, please. Yes, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Right, okay. I hope you can because I'm just going to be talking. We are way past our time schedule and we do not want to lose our mentors who created time to join us at this session. Some of them really have to go, but we have actually asked that in session. So thank you, um, audio and the uh, connection problem. You were excellent with that moderation. And our panelists, wow, you were the perfect choice for today's webinar. And we appreciate as well our participants. Um, I hope you've all had a terrific time as well. And you're going away with impactful learning points armed with decisions for your future political engagements. Moving on quickly, like I said, we have the presentation of women who have identified with 
really base and have offered for the political cause of women in politics. Indeed, we are proud to present our political mentors today. My name is Adiola Aziz, as said, and I'm one of 12 women and one man who founded WIMBIS 19 years ago. This is all about women supporting women. The ladies we are presenting today are very keen to support, to guide, and to hold our hands through the difficult journeys they have walked and ensure that upcoming female politicians have easier pathway to success. Today, we introduce the WIMBY's Women in Politics Mentoring Program, and we will be presenting the ladies who will be leading the way for our women who require mentoring to navigate the political space. This mentorship program is distinct as it creates a platform that welcomes and supports women's political participation. Beyond the rhetoric of inclusion, we are enhancing women's leadership capacity by bridging the gap, the gap sorry, in the talent pipeline, reducing barriers to entry via a strong network of political women and providing relevant resources to kick off a successful political career. We are starting off with these six vibrant, powerful, inspiring women who have dared to compete and have won and are still winning in their areas of influence. As we journey on, we will add and seek out more credible and valuable women to join them in our mentors program. Now, we will be calling all applications of existing and intending female politicians who need mentoring. Our secretariat will keep you updated and we go as we go along via our communications channels. Now to the moment. I'm pleased, excited, delighted to introduce our amazing mentors. And to do that, I have no other person to call on than Oluwaya Misibusari, a one-time deputy governorship aspirant, to please present our mentors now. Yeah, Missy, over to you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Aziz, and um, thank you for that um, introduction. Um, ladies, good afternoon. I trust you've all had a good time so far. Uh, I've been following the charts, and I realized that um, mentoring is something that came up quite um, in a number of the conversations. So it must mean that we're doing something right at Wimpole. We seem to have read a lot of people's minds. And um, like Mrs. Aziz said, we've um, carefully selected um, some women in the political space. Uh, we're starting small, and what we've done is we've identified some people who we believe that um, we can start with. And then as we, as we improve and get bigger, then we'll bring on some more people. I'll just quickly share something that my grandmother used to say to me when I was much younger. And she used to ask, um, she used to tell us that when she went visiting to people who had um, ailments and she was proposing some sort of remedy. And the question that would be asked is that, have you ever suffered what I'm suffering? And if the answer was yes, then they would listen to the remedy she was proposing and they would use it. So what we're trying to say here is that these women that have been identified are women who have run and who have held activities in the political space and who have succeeded at it. And that's why we believe that they can help us in um, handholding and walking the road with younger um, political um, aspirants. So can I start, I would start immediately and I would start um, with this order. I would like to call on Honorable Abike Dabiri Erewa. Honorable Abike Dabiri Erewa is a Nigerian politician and former member of the Nigeria Federal House of Reps, representing Nikorudu constituency in Lagos State. And she did this very well from 2003 to 2015. She is the senior special assistant to President Muhammadu Buhari on foreign affairs and diaspora and chairman chief executive of the Nigerian Diaspora Commission. I present to you Honorable Abike Dabiri Erewa. The second mentor I'll be presenting to you today is my sister, Ambassador Folake Marcos Bailey. 
Ambassador Folake Makosbelo is a former Nigeria's ambassador to Malawi and Zambia. She is a colleague, she's a lawyer, she's a politician and an entrepreneur. I present to you Ambassador Folake Makosbelo. The third mentor I'll be presenting to you this afternoon is Mrs. Ibim Semenitari. She is the former acting managing director of the Niger Delta Development Commission. She is an award-winning investigative journalist, communicator, administrator, author, and financial analyst. She served as a honorable commissioner and ministry of information and communications in River State between 2009 to 2015 a duty she discharged with her heart and excellently well. I will move on swiftly to Ms. Hadiza Bala Usman. She is a Nigerian politician who since 2016 has been serving as the managing director of the Nigerian Ports Authority, a position which and duty which she has discharged effectively and very well. She was previously the chief of staff to the governor of Kaduna State from 2015 to 2016. I will go on to Princess Ajoke Orelupe Adifulure, who is an accomplished woman with many years of experience in public service. And that says a lot about her person and her achievements. She served as deputy governor of Lagos State from 2011 to 2015. Please join me in welcoming her on board. Finally, I would call on Honorable Nena Elendu KJ, who's been our moderator since morning and who's done a wonderful job. Thank you, Nena. Nena is a Nigerian politician and was a member of the Nigerian Federal House of Reps, representing the Bendel Federal constituency between 27, 2007 and 2019. I will now go back in the order in which I called our main Yes, I think we lost um, Yanisi there. Um, I think we were going to present and um, can the back office please um, show the mentors as we present their names. If uh, Yanisi comes back and somebody let me know, the first person to call is Honorable Abike Dabiri. Well, participant, we want you to engage them. Can you give them a round of applause by, from the chat sign? A round of applause, please, to our mentors. Let's encourage them as they are going to uh, be your mentors. Thank you very, very much. Um, the next person is Ambassador Falake Marcos Belo. Can you feature her, please? A round of applause to her as well. Very amazing, powerful women who will, you know, be our mentors. Mrs. Ibim Semenitari is next. Well done, Ibim. Thank you so much for accepting this. Ibim is there. Thank you all for encouraging them with your claps and thumbs up. Mrs. Hadiza Bala Usman, is she there? Thank you, Hadiza. Thank you so much for your time and um, attention to our program and accepting as well. Okay, we will then have Princess Ajoke Orelope Adefuli, a staunch supporter of Bimbo. She has given of herself financially, physically, and she's just a Princess Ajoke Orelope Adefuli. The last but not the least is our, is our moderator for today, none other than Honorable Nena. She has been supporting us back office, front office, everywhere, right? 
Nana, are you there? Are you? I don't say a round of applause for our moderator, Nana. Can you all do so? Thank you very, very much. I know you have all spent beyond the time that you asked us. What I will then ask you all to please do in the same order, Abike, if you will start, can you just say one word or two, any comment to our participants, you know, so they would like to hear your voice. Okay? Okay. Can I just go ahead and say one word? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much and um, good afternoon. Participants, panelists, speakers, my fellow women, a very good afternoon to you. Well, I just want to say thank you for putting this together because uh, a lot of mentoring is needed, particularly for women. It's getting tougher, it's going to get very, very tough. This encouraging women, particularly younger women, is much appreciated. I have an informal mentoring program, and I think it's going to be really impactful. So thank you, Wendy, for putting this together. I hope that it will be a regular thing, not just a one-off thing. Well, for me, I just say that uh, to win, get to venture, get to succeed. I think the first thing is the courage to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to stand for an election. And I heard one of your, one of your speakers say something the other time, comparing first ladies and women in politics. They're totally different. It's different being a first lady than being a woman who has contested for an election and, you know, for, for a position. So they're totally different things. So I'm just saying that for women, we must have the courage to go out and say we want to do. If it's a you, why not? If it is a you, you know something you can do. I left MTA to just contest for election, but I never knew whether I would win or lose. But 12 years on, I was in parliament, and today I'm the chairman of the House So we must have the courage to come out and do what we want to do. It varies from state to state, you know, party to party. But I think first thing is the political parties need, need to make a conscious effort to say, we're putting this women forward. And then women that are qualified, a whole lot of them. But women like you particularly do not get involved. I think that is the problem. You leave it to women who ordinarily you wouldn't leave your destiny to. So my, my advice and appeal is, if you know you're interested, get involved. It varies from state to state party to party, but with women who have done it before, you can learn from them like we are doing today. So I just want to encourage women, and I tell you that the bad news is that it's going to get worse. That is the bad news. It's getting worse, it just may get worse, more, more, you know, be worse than what we have today. In parliament, there are less women that we had starting from 1990. There are less women political appointees. We had some female governors before, now you have maybe just one or two out of 36 states. So it's going to get worse, but we shouldn't be discouraged. Women must keep supporting women, it's very important. And then, what are the challenges? A lot of challenges, money is a challenge. There's still cultural issues that is a challenge. But we can overcome all those things. And the key thing is the few women that are already in politics that are, that are there must ensure to be role models for the younger ones so that they, they don't look at you and say, oh, I don't want to do what she's doing. So let's continue to be role models, do the best we can do, have integrity as our watchword. We are women for crying out loud. It's not, it's not a shame to make them involved in crime, and, and terrible things. So let's be good role models, let's do the right things as women, and let integrity be our work. So there should be someone that guides you. You must have a, a guiding principle. And then you know, fear of God, of course, is very important. And the key thing is, know where you're going, be focused and don't be distracted. Like I said, it's going to get tougher, but you know what? We don't have to achieve together. So thank you for inviting me, and we look forward thank to the celebration. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, can we please keep it under a minute? because we still have other things to do, going back to the Q&A. Thank you so much, mentors. We appreciate you. Thank you. Keep it short and brief. Thank you very much. The next speaker, please. Okay, so I'll take over from here. I will- Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Back, well done. Flying for a while. I'm back on now. So the next speaker is um, Ambassador Falake Marcos Belo, my sister who has, um, given a good account of herself in her activities. Uh, please, I'd appreciate that you keep your comments to please 30 seconds. <laughs> We're running behind shadow. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name is Folake Marcos Bello, and um, I'm glad to have been asked to mentor women. Um, let me assure the women that all of us are in it together. There are three roads into getting into this political space. The first one is that you can be elected, you can go for the elective position, 
you can be appointed, and of course you can be supportive. All roles are important. It's not until you get on the platform or you uh, decide to be everywhere to put out yourself for a position that you're a politician. All of us are in it together. And um, I hope we can make some um, um, inroad, inroad and have more women. But for me, more women in the elective position, more women in appointed position, and more women supporting the political space. Thank you very much for having me and um, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll move on to Mrs. Ibim Semenitari. Would also appreciate that you keep it brief. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wimpole. Thank you, Wimbiz. Um, thank you for the privilege support of the women. Clearly, this is um, something that I think is greatly needed. Um, women holding other women's hands because the men really do find a way to network and provide requisite support for each other. Um, I'm glad we what Falake has said because you really do need women operating in all the spheres. And I guess as we take this forward, we will be drawing on experience personal and that of our peers, but also we will need to begin to talk about finding where the money is and getting it to back the women. I'm gonna say thank you again very much for this. And um, this is just the beginning, we'll take it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll quickly move on to um, Hadiza Bala Usman for her comments. Are you there? Yes, I am. Um, Thank good you. Good afternoon, ladies. Um, I would like to appreciate Wimbis for organizing this and to also say that um, this is needed. We all need to mentor ourselves um, every time. I'm asked to be a mentor. I always say, um, while I'm mentoring, I'm also being mentored. So a lot of the mentees don't realize that it's actually a two-way street when it comes to mentoring. So a lot of times when we're mentoring you, I also get mentored by some of your convictions, your courage and um, your resilience and your conviction on towing the path. So it is a two-way street. Um, while I'm mentoring, I'm also getting mentored. Um, so thank you very much, Wimbies. And um, as all my sisters have said, uh, it's a tough road um, being a woman in politics, but we all need to remain in there, remain supportive of each other, hold our, hold our hands and push you forward. Um, what matters is for us to remain in the political space. They will discourage us, they will put you down, they will drag you down, but just know that um, you have um, your sisters there um, willing to reach out and support you across political lines. So um, hello, everybody, that um, Nana, Binta, you know, all uh, my, my political sisters across um, political parties, um, just to say hello. And I'm appreciative of this opportunity to mentor and be mentored. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Hadiza. I particularly liked your comments about it being a two-way street because we constantly learn. I'll then go on quickly to Princess Ajoke Urilupe Adifunure, please, for your brief comments. Are you there, please? Good afternoon, distinguished women. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me, please? Yes, can we can. Me? Yes, we yes, can. Good afternoon, distinguished women of Nigeria, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and to be part of this very, very important platform. Uh, all my life, I believe in the empowerment of women in all ramification and uh, I'm so happy to be part of uh, this uh, few selected women to be, to mentor other women. Uh, like Bala said, uh, we too will be mentored, sharing from each other, learn more lessons from each other, and uh, learn more political uh, activities. Uh, we've been in it for a long time, and I think that um, the step that we have taken in ensuring that uh, women participation, certain percentage has to be included in the constitution in the right direction, that would be a, 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 an instrument to use. And at the same time, we need to also 
do some political um, activities that would get towards it. It has been done before. When you look at Southwest, that was a shift through the Ministry of Women Affairs in Nigeria, which I happen to champion. And uh, we are losing the, that trend now. And uh, of, of course, both lower and upper chambers of National Assembly, we have lost so many women. Women have done so well in business space. I'm sure that with this political space, we are going to make a lot of difference with this platform. And for our women that you have selected, I so much believe in them because I know all of them. And we know what they are antecedents. So for all of us working together with all of you and few others that are still out, out there, I'm sure, I'm, I'm convinced that we'll make a lot of difference. But one other thing I need to share with you is that women, we must allow, we must see ourselves, because I, I can see the trend of uh, those that are willing to participate in politics is very, very obvious. So if you know you want to participate, you have to leave yourself out and make up your mind, like Abike said, Honorable Abike said, that you have to be determined that you want to go into this business. It's a serious business. So you have to make up your mind and zero your mind on it and be determined that you're going to go into this and what achieve from it. So if you zero your mind into it, then uh, you have achieved one. And other thing that needed to be done, when we have uh, opportunity of meeting together after the lockdown and the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we'll be able to share more experiences and working together and uh, see how we can develop a framework in achieving this goal. It's a lot of new initiative, and I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for um, those comments. Uh, the comments that impact Wimbis, we will look into. Um, so can I go to the last mentor and not the least? Uh, I'm able and able um, compare for the event today, uh, moderator, Honorable Nena Elendu KJ, please. Can we have a few comments from you? Yes, thank you very much um, for finding me worthy to be um, a mentor on the Mimbi's Mentoring Program. And I'd like to share a quote by John Crosby, and he says, mentoring is a brain to pick, an ear to listen, and a push in the right direction. It also is, in my opinion, an opportunity for us to challenge the narrative that women just don't help women. And so I am indeed very, very pleased to be a part of this group of amazing women. And I'm hoping that in the future, we can do things that will indeed impact the political space and hopefully inspire young women to be even better people, educate them, as well as make them more interested in this dark and murky, but important waters of life. Thank you very much for that, Nena. So I'm going to come back to you straight away so that we can carry on with the question and answer session. Thank you. Nena, can you hear me? We're back to you. Nena. Okay. Um, hi, let me see. Can see me coming? Yeah. Is she? Is see me there? 
Yes, I am. Okay, okay, can you just go through the questions and answers and then just, and when she comes back on, she'll take over. Our panelists are still okay. on with us. Thank you so much for your patience and um, hanging in there with us. But um, it's obviously a very interesting um, session and quite a few questions and a lot of our at, uh, participants are still on. So over to you, Simi, thanks. Um, great. Thank you, Mrs. Obiemi. Um, and thank you to the panelists for such an engaging session. Um, we'll just ask a few questions from the Q&A box. And um, I'll start uh, with uh, the first one from Sharon Adebayo. She's asking, um, how do we get the Nigerian political space away from these gender issues to a place where the most qualified candidates are put in appropriate positions. I would like to direct this question to Prof. Professor Asenua. Okay. Um, Simi, could you just take the question again? I got a bit of it, but I didn't get the whole thing. Simi, you're muted. Regaining political apologies, space. Apologies. How do we get the Ni yes? How do we get the Nigerian political space away from these gender issues to a place where the most qualified candidates are put in appropriate positions? Okay, um, uh, that's a very interesting one. I don't. I think that it it, it, it trying to separate them and imagine that taking on the gender issue means that you may not get the most qualified. I, I think that actually taking on the gender issues and taking on the issues of inclusion for all the excluded is what's likely to get us to a point where we all become very merit-based. I think that the reality is that it's just not fair and it doesn't bring the best each time we say that we when we recognize that there's been a lot of, there's been the, I use this word, the institutionalization of exclusion means that many of those who are competent never even think to come up, never challenge. It's when we all come in and then we can begin to challenge, then it becomes, and I note that Clement, my colleague did say earlier on that it doesn't have to last forever. It's just for a time for us to see what potentials all the others that we have excluded have. I think that in opening up the political space, what we need is just to have inclusion for all those who have been historically excluded. Then we'd be able to show competence in the areas where we didn't think that competence was available. And then we begin to demystify. Historically, or what's been is that it's men who can lead. Now, what we've seen is that so many men cannot lead it was thought that women could not lead because they don't have the capacity. And we've seen so many women lead and lead very well. So the more we include, the more we begin to break down uh, the myths that we hold about competence. And then it becomes easier to question and say, why are we choosing this person? Why are we, they, we, we can continue. We, we, we just have got to understand that one is not superior to the other. They run. They run parallel and you strengthen merit by ensuring that you show um, the possibilities that those who have been excluded can bring to the table. And um, I think that's the way we can open up the political space in such a way that we will then in the long run go, go beyond exclusion. But I think that we shouldn't be in a hurry to go beyond taking on the issues of those who have been marginalized because it's been centuries of exclusion. And so we shouldn't imagine that we will just be able to include overnight. Thank you very much, Prof. Include first, and then we talk about competence later. Thank you very much. So I'll go on to the next question. Um, we'll just ask a few more questions because we're out of time. So please forgive us. Thank you for sending in these questions. And our second question is, uh, do we have an, an active women civil society that educate and assist in mentorship? Once a woman has a solid support, she will take up the challenge. 
Well, I think the Wimpole session that we just, uh, mentorship program that we just introduced um, sort of answers that. But in terms of the first part of the question, do we have an active women's civil society? I would like to direct um, Mr. Clement to just quickly give us the landscape um, from the CSOs and just give us just an idea in terms of um, his experience. Does he think we have enough uh, civil society organizations that who, who actively champion women causes, uh, 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 balanced um, women inclusion, I'm sorry. Mr. Clements, are you there? Thank you, Simi. Yes, there are, uh, is a huge uh, um, and diverse group of women organizations who, who are working uh, on, on the issues of women participation. Uh, at the uh, beginning of my comment, I, I had mentioned, you know, for those who uh, go back in history, the role that groups like Women in Nigeria have played. There have been since then a lot more organizations, um, uh, and I could mention lots of names. Uh, Ambassador Koyo Toyo, in, uh, who was a former member of the National Assembly, has been leading quite some efforts in that regard. Uh, a lot of organizations working on different issues on inclusion, uh, even on improving the legal framework uh, are in existence and, and working and collaborating together. I think the point is uh, about um, building synergy. And I think that's the importance of what, what WIMBIS has done today. Uh, you could actually be part of that major stimulus for increasing the synergy that is needed to, to give timelines for bringing about some of the changes that we, we've talked about. And I strongly believe um, that there is an opportunity that exists. Uh, it's still one year into uh, the current ninth assembly. There's a lot that can be done to improve the position of women. And I think uh, the panelists have outlined a whole lot of these issues. Uh, my, my colleague, uh, uh, the Lenin's advocate, Ahmed Raji, was very blunt in putting out the obstacles, the challenges, and, and the, the, the real um, bottom line of some of these challenges. And I think that if we take some of these suggestions and some of these observations, uh, we can help help to uh, work together, building synergy and taking uh, solutions forward. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clement, uh, for that uh, apt um, response. I'll just ask two more questions. Um, and the second one, uh, the third one, sorry, is directly to Senator Binta. Senator Binta, are you there? Okay, I see you, fantastic. So um, Gloria is asking, how many women have you brought to the political ladder and what was the motivation? Senator Binta, can we take you off mute? We can't hear you, apologies. Okay, it appears that we're having technical issues. So I'll come back to Senator Binta in a few minutes. Um, I'll just ask um, uh, Mr. Raji, our SAN, um, this question since he was, um, he had, he has a very, very vast experience um, in the electoral value chain from elections, uh, from being a rec to being in the, in the tribunal. So we'd like to ask, apart from wanting a fairer representation in politics or governance, do women actually understand the rough and tumble of political life and are they ready for it? From your experience. Thank you, Madam, for the question. I wouldn't want to be too hard, but I doubt whether the women are ready for that. Uh, my little experience well, we have a few ones who have done very well, like uh, Senator Binta, she's done very well. Um, uh, Senator, I mean, uh, Honorable KJ, and lately Ekunife, who is doing fantastically well, and may emerge as governor of a number of states very shortly, God willing. But majority of the women, they are happy being the one playing the power behind the scene, a uh, first lady, having the pet project and whatever you and all those kind of things. And which is why most men really will not take them serious when they say 
like they are asking for power, they are asking for what, because what most men do, they are the real power behind them. I do not think they are ready for the, for, for, for what you have said, I, I doubt it. Because they would rather be first lady. Have you ever had any man saying he's the first man in the state, even where a woman is acting? But there is no state today, you don't have office of first lady. And they are into projects, they are happy with that. And uh, this is just my, my observation based on what I've seen in politics. They would rather form women something around their men and then be the women wing and whatever. Look, imagine somebody say you want to have a political party for women when it is clearly unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. Even if you have the party for, for women, can they go there and do meetings in the middle of the night? They can they do a lot of things in the night and what they do? I mean, it's, 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 to your question, I doubt if they are ready. I doubt. And God never Thank made a mistake when he created man first. I'm sorry to say this. God created Thank man Thank you very first, much. Then created woman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raju. We look forward to you writing a book to prepare, help to prepare women in future. Um, Maybe God will do that. I can Thank you very that. much. <laughs> so we'll head back to Senator Binta. I hope she's ready for us. Um, Gloria, I'll repeat my question again. She's asking for your track record. And I know that from my experience, women always, it's just, much, it's just a natural instinct to help other women, but we probably don't catalog these the, the women that we help, the experiences that we have. So it would just be good to just share one or two of the things that you did, you know, in your very rich and distinct political career. Thank you so much. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you now. We can hear you. Yeah. We can hear you now. Thank you, Senator. The question is how many women have I mentored? Or is it experience? Your experience basically, um, how many women? I'm sure you can't count, but you know, your experience in mentoring women. I just share with us um, well, if along the way. Are... Have you about it? Have you been intentional about bringing other women along? I think that's the, that's the point of the question. Of course, one has to be intentionally bringing other women along because today I'm no more in the, in the National Assembly, but will have been my desire to see more women in the National Assembly. I can give a vivid uh, example of what happened in 2003 when I was representing Kaduna South. I spoke with the former governor and I said, why wouldn't you make it a reality that each senatorial district you can produce one woman? And to my amazement, 2003, two women emerged from Kaduna State, one from Northern uh, uh, Senatorial District, another from the South, and one that I'm representing in the Central. So three women emerged by talking to the wife of the governor, talking to the governor to see more women coming on board. I represented the central of Kaduna. The Ruth Angle came from the southern part and uh, so Dr. Sani from the northern part. And I think that thing happened again in Lagos where three women came on board from there. Nella Deje can attest to it in 2010, she wasn't ready to come back to the National Assembly. And I had to encourage her for her to be there. And today, she is one woman that everybody is looking on to. The next person that we have spoken, and I'm happy she's back to the National Assembly, is uh, Kitty Khadijad, who happens to be a former minister and now back to the state, I mean, National Assembly. Mentoring is key. If we that we have been there before, we need to bring other women on board. And we can start from the grassroots. From the councillor. When I was the chairman of the party, I tried vigorously to see how we can bring more women on board. And luckily, we have one more one woman to the National Assembly in the House of Rep. So I am 
happy than most of the crop of women that are out there to mentor other women. And I know there are other women that needed to be, bring, I mean, to be brought on board in mentoring. So we cannot just look at the National Assembly. We can start from the councillor to the State Assembly, and now we move on to the National Assembly. But it's not been an easy chat. Some women, when you talk to them, they will think that, ah, I just want to be a member of the parliament. But there are other things that need to be put before you think of considering going into election. And most of those things, probably those ones that are going to be the mentors trying to mentee others, will put them on ground for them to understand. But it's not an easy task. We need to yes. make some certain sacrifices. Like what Raji mentioned, the sun, which obviously I, I disagree with him totally. An incident happened when we were supposed to have a meeting. And the meeting was supposed so, to start by 10 p.m. It went to 12, from 12, they now said 12, 2 a.m. And someone looked at me and asked, Mitchell, don't you think you have to go back to your husband? And I looked at him and said, don't you have a wife? So if we're here to work for the progress of our country or to our community, the issue of whether she is a he or a she wouldn't have arrived. But the right. most important thing is for us to see how we can move and make women come together irrespective of our uh, gender differences. But the focal point is that we Thank want you. to have a better Thank government you, and a good governance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Binta. Thank you. And uh, we appreciate all the um, everyone that has com contributed and asked questions today and made this session very engaging. I would like to hand over to our amazing moderator, Honorable Nena, to just review and, um, and wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, for that amazing uh, segment. I'd like to, um, in thanking all the participants, like to recap the conversations that have been had. And one of the conversations, and my takeaway from this conversation, is the fact that we're lightways years away from where it is that we intend to go to. I've also realized that there's no cookie cutter to the solutions to the reducing space for women in the political space. I've also come to learn today that the legislature and indeed the Nigerian people feel and believe that the legislature holds the key to opening up the spaces and that the confidence in the legislature is one that we still have to earn. I also have come to learn that the legislators must listen to the voice of the people. The voice of a legislator is to collate the aggregate opinion of a critical mass of the people at whose pleasure they serve. And 50% of Nigeria's population say that we must hold up half of the sky. We are saying that 50% of the population deserves at least 35% affirmative action. WIMBIS has done an absolutely amazing job of opening up the spaces and encouraging women to come out here and have a conversation and interrogate the subject matter in a way that probably has never been interrogated before. And then, of course, the topic, the right to win, elevates the conversation and says to women that we're just not asking for the right to run, but we're asking for the right to win. And knowledge, as everybody has said, is what we require to run in these elections. Knowledge of the laws that probably should help, that probably hinder, and that will be the way for us to achieve the 35% affirmative action that we so desire. I'd like to thank everybody for joining in this session and hopeful that we're able to elevate you, we're able to inspire, and we're hoping that even with this session and the female mentors that have been unveiled during the session, that the women will understand that we have come to recalibrate the narrative of the Nigerian woman and to say that the time has gone past where they said that the Nigerian woman was reluctant to help the Nigerian woman. Wimbiz has changed that narrative and the conversations here have shown that the strong women 
who are capable of doing the things that we must do, that we must interrogate space, and we must be prepared to stand up. We must be prepared to challenge the narrative that the ceiling may appear like a concrete ceiling, but in spite of how tough it looks, that a bit of pressure will push the bar towards where it is that we want to go. I'd like to thank you very, very much for giving me the opportunity to moderate this. And I'd like to thank all the panelists for their amazing, frank, open conversations. And I'm hoping that we have inspired at least a couple thousand Nigerian women to try to challenge the murky waters of this political space. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, amiable moderator, Honorable Nena OKJ. Okay, we thank you very much for moderating the session um, very well. Um, so on behalf of the Board of Trustees and Executive Council of Women in Management, Business and Public Service, WIMBIS, and the WIMPOL Committee, I want to say a very big thank you to our speakers this afternoon. It's been a very engaging, informative session. So the most distinguished Senator Binta Gaba, we say thank you so much for your contribution and thank you for your inspiring each and every one of us this afternoon. Mr. Ahmed Raji, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, we thank you very much for your contributions and we assure you that we have capable women who are ready to take on their place in politics. Thank you very much, sir. Professor Ayo Asenua, thank you very much, madam, for your contributions. We thank you very much. And um, we, we will take up the challenge that you threw at us um, at Wimby's to lead the movement and take on the advocacy at the National Assembly for the um, changes to the electoral laws. Thank you very much, ma. And Mr. Clement Wankwa, thank you very much for your contribution as well. We're very grateful for your insights during this discussion. Um, Secretariat, we're going to have a poll now. Um, so to the participants, thank you so much for your engagement. It's been, we can all see that it's a very interesting topic. And we all as women have to participate in the movement as advised by the most distinguished Senator Binta Gaba. So we have a poll coming up now and we'll be very pleased if you can um, fill the evaluation um, that's going to be put up on the screen. Your feedback is very important to us. So Secretariat, please feel put on, okay, it's on now. So participants, thank you for your engagement. Can you please complete the evaluation Poll. Your feedback is extremely important to us so that we know where to focus and where to improve on and how to move the discussion forward. Thank you very much. We have two, two, two minutes to do this because we've run out of time. And while we're doing this, I would also like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, The Guardian Newspaper, and to also extend our special thank you to Lady Maiden Alex Ibru, the chairman, publisher, and chief executive officer of The Guardian Newspapers for her tremendous support over the years, and in particular, um, for this session. Thank you very much, Madam. I would also like to recognize and say a big thank you to one of our key supporters as well, 
Princess Sarah Adebisi Shosan. Um, she's one of our key supporters in Wimpole and she's been very, very active during the chat session. Thank you very much, Madam, for, for your participation. To the participants, we have an evaluation link that we're going to send to you by email. And can you please respond to us when you get it? Because your feedback, as I said earlier, is very important to us. The key thing is for us to conti continue to improve um, the ways in which we engage the members of the public and your feedback will help us to do that. I would also like to invite our dear participants who are not WIMBY's associates to please join us one day. As it's been said many times, women have to support each other. And this is one platform that we can use to support each other. So if you're not part of us, please join us. We would love to have you with us. And for those who are associates and are yet to renew their membership, we implore you to kindly do so as soon as possible. If you have any inquiries, can you please contact us via email? It's membership at wimbies.org. We would love to hear from you and we'll respond to your inquiries. Once again, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and Executive Council of Wimby's and the Wimpole Committee, I would like to say thank you very much to all our speakers, to our amiable moderator, to the Wimpole Committee members, our mentors. We thank you so much for spending over two and a half hours with us on this program, which has gone on for much longer than we anticipated but we still have all our participants on board, which shows that the topic is actually very apt. And it is about time that the issue of inclusion is addressed. Thank you once again for your time, for your participation and God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs>